What you are about to hear is not, 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 not a podcast. <laughs> this is a global conversation recorded live in real time with real people, journalists, business leaders, academics, politicians. I think the term is a deep state. Oh dear. Investors, experts, diplomats, citizens, coming together from around the world to share their views and ask our guests the questions. If you would like to join this conversation or hear our incredible library of past conversations, please visit our website, pm101.club, and join the fastest growing conscious community on the free internet. Thanks for being here. Enjoy, 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 enjoy the show, the show, the show, the show, show. Hey everyone, welcome back to Politics and Media 101, the place where we all hear live and direct from people in the news in their own voices, in their own words, in long form, and where anyone who wants to can join to ask them a question, share their thoughts, or just listen. We're just now starting to release recorded portions of our live conversations for the first time, and we're grateful to you for joining us. Today, we're excited to release part of a conversation, interview, and audience Q&A we had with Walter Schaub. He's one of the top experts in the United States on political corruption. He's a former director of the U.S. Office of Government Ethics, and he's now a leading voice at the Project on Government Oversight. Public officials are supposed to honor public trust. In any organized society, there are people with power to make certain decisions. Mayors or city council members often have the power to decide which potholes get fixed. Governors often have the power to decide who gets help and when after a natural disaster. State legislators often have the power to decide how public funds are split between school districts. Members of Congress decide on laws that have the power to prevent harm or create harm in millions of lives, and the President of the United States not only acts as America's top executive, but also leads the free world and sets a tone that reflects on all of us, really impacting our power and standing in the world in big ways. All of these people hold positions of public trust. They owe their allegiance to us, and we deserve to know that we're first on their list of priorities. If they're taking money from someone who wants to influence them, or if they owe money to someone who has power over them, or if anything else knocks you and I and the public down from the top of their priority list, that's a problem. It's something we deserve to know, and it's something that needs to be fixed. Corruption exists in lots of forms in lots of different places. Some countries have laws and press who expose it, but in other countries, corrupt officials control literally everything, giving citizens no recourse. We got into this topic in depth with Walter. What does corruption look like in the United States? What are some of the worst examples? What kind of systems and laws do we have in place to battle it? Are those systems and laws good enough, or do they need to be updated, and how? Few people anywhere are better suited to speak on this than Walter. We had a great conversation with excellent audience questions, and we hope you enjoy it. As always, if you like or dislike what you hear... If you want to find out how to join us live almost every day of the week, maybe ask one of our upcoming guests a question, please visit our website, pm101.live or pm101.club. They both work and will get you to the same place where you can find all that and more. Without any further ado, let's roll the tape. Can you talk about something that we may not know about you, something from your upbringing? or early career that really shaped your perspective on right and wrong and drove you into a career in government ethics? I think uh, the thing that most fits that description is growing up with a father who worked in the federal government and seeing him go off every day feeling proud that he was serving his country. And um, it just really uh, created a sense in our household that that service is really important and being engaged in this democracy is important, that it's not a passive kind of thing. And that led me to always want to go in the government because I felt like I wanted to contribute. I wanted to go to work feeling at least like I was working for the good guys and was focused on the mission uh, and sort of chose a series of assignments once I got into government, led me to the Office of Government Ethics. Um, and then while I was there, I really got focused on presidential nominees because I was really interested in making sure that the people with the most power to do harm resolved their conflicts of interest and committed to doing it in advance. Uh, so that's really the road I went down. And 
Frankly, I always thought I'd spend my entire career in government, but that kind of became impossible after um, 2017. <laughs> yes, see, there was there was a big um uh big to do about your resignation. I mean, we we can get into that in a little bit. I kind of want to first though outline political corruption for people because sometimes people might think of corruption as an interest of hobbyists or news obsessives who are tracking every development in DC and it's really distant from concerns of regular people. But corruption has real world impacts. It can change how effective public services can be, or if public resources are used in the public interest. Can you tell us why corruption should matter to the everyday American who maybe doesn't have time to follow the news or doesn't work in government? Why should they give a damn about political corruption? We give the people who lead our government great power over our lives. They ask us for it, and through election or other means, they get it. Uh, so they owe us their sole and undivided loyalty as they're performing their work. Uh, the kind of corruption we think about most commonly would be conflicts of interest. Um, and that a way to show you how that might hurt is think about this recent pandemic. Uh, it should be very concerning to people if, as the last administration and the current administration are scrambling to try to save lives and put uh, to an end a, a virus that has killed now, what, about 700,000 Americans? Um, if the people making those decisions had a financial interest in one company or another doing better, and they might make decisions that would benefit that company and increase the value of their stock, and it might not be the decision that would protect us the best and people could die. Uh, so it became very important and remains very important to make sure that the people who are making decisions in this crisis don't have financial interests. Um, you know, we see things like people in Flint, Michigan, being poisoned by lead in their water or forest fires in California. And you want to make sure that people making those decisions don't have financial interest in the thing they're deciding. I think we also sometimes define corruption too narrowly, and we just think in terms of bribes or conflicts of interest. And I think we need to think in terms of corruption being the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. And that then leads us to a lot of other things being potentially corrupt. If you want to live in a free society where the people in government are representing you, and making decisions in your interests and not uh, their own or some other group other than the nation as a whole, uh, you need to care about corruption because these decisions uh, will directly impact your life. We see in countries where any kind of anti-corruption effort has completely collapsed that bridges fall down and people get poisoned. We, we saw in... Um, Libya, that massive explosion that took down a gigantic building and uh, was felt across the city. These are the kinds of things that happen as a result of corruption. I also think that when one group uh, dominates, um, say, for instance, a racial group like white people, um, then the country isn't representing all people. And so we need to be very concerned about uh, things like voter suppression that are targeting people of very vulnerable groups. We don't tend to talk about that as corruption, but I think we should because the power being entrusted to these leaders isn't being used for all of the people they're supposed to be representing. They shouldn't be representing just their voters. They should be representing the people in their jurisdiction who've turned their lives over to the care of these uh, public servants. Um, yeah, so you just gave a great example of policymakers or people in the executive branch. Not It's not a good thing if they can profit off of select companies. And we have a current case going on right now, Walter, which blows my mind. Senator Richard Burr, for everybody in the audience, infamous 
traded key stocks soon after a classified Senate briefing in the early days of the pandemic. The classified briefing, folks, was going into the depths about how dire and drastic this pandemic could be. Uh, the next day, he picks up the phone and he calls his stockbroker. He calls his brother-in-law. Um, to many in the public, this looks like clear insider trading, Mr. Schaub. Why isn't Senator Burr being prosecuted? And more specifically, I know that you're not like involved in the case, literally. How do we prevent this from happening in the future? Is it a problem of legislation, enforcement, or is it both? So, you know, I want to be careful in talking about Richard Burr specifically because um, this is a matter that should be investigated. And if it is, he'll be entitled to the presumption of innocence until proven otherwise. Uh, and also, it's not just um, Richard Burr. Kelly Leffler made a lot of purchases after a briefing. Uh, this summer, Nancy Pelosi's husband made a bunch of trades just before Congress announced that it was taking less severe action than was anticipated against big tech companies. Um, and in many ways, it almost doesn't even matter if insider trading is occurring. It creates the appearance of insider trading. Uh, so certainly, if somebody can prove that insider trading occurred in any of these cases, the individuals involved should be prosecuted. Those are tough cases to actually make, so they may, they may be acquitted. But I think that shouldn't be the test. The test shouldn't be, are you a criminal? If you're a member of Congress, um, you have a responsibility to avoid even the appearance of, of misconduct. And I think in a free country, the appearance of corruption is as dangerous in many cases as corruption because we it dis. It, it makes people disengage in politics. It makes them think, oh, they're all, what's the point? And we live in a country where an enormous percentage of our population doesn't vote. I think if we did a better job eliminating the perception of corruption, we might gain some of those people voting. And it doesn't even matter which party they voted for. What matters is that more people would be taking an active role uh, in our government. And so I think... Um, the cure is to simply ban members of Congress from trading stocks. Nobody held a gun to their head and said, you must run for office and accept this power we're entrusting to you. Um, and so given that we're forcing you to do this, we shouldn't inconvenience you. Well, you know, cabinet officials come into government and they sell off stocks. They sell off personal businesses that they own. And the average career lifespan of a political appointee is two years. Uh, then they leave government. Some, you know, are, are, have lasted eight years in some administrations, but the average uh, tenure is more like two years, and they're giving up all of this. Well, members of Congress typically serve much longer than that, and although they're just one of many voting on a thing, they wield terrific power, and so. I don't think it's too much to ask them uh, to stop trading stocks. They could do it by simply divesting things and investing in non-conflicting assets like diversified mutual funds. They could put them in blind trusts, although the blind trust program will need to be modified because in the legislative branch, the blind trust is not blind at all, and, and some things need to be done to, to improve that. Um, but it would be a start to ban them for, from trading these things. And that would at least uh, end the insider trading problem. It would be nice to also end the conflicts of interest problem by making them divest, but at least uh, not trading would solve our immediate problem. Walter, I wanted to get into corruption from almost a comparative kind of angle here. Corruption is obviously a global problem that affects citizens of every country. Our democracy is one of the world's oldest and most prestigious, and I like to think personally, having worked in Congress, having worked for a governor, that we have some of the best institutions in the world, bar none. Um, but how do we actually, my thoughts aside, how do we actually compare to other countries on issues of public corruption? Are we a peer to other major democracies, or maybe we should view ourselves a little bit differently than that? You know, I feel like it would be a little beyond my expertise to comment on um, 
other countries. But what I can say is that when I was leading the Office of Government Ethics and for years before that while I was there, we had visitors from a variety of different countries on a regular basis, uh, and they would send them here to study our systems. Uh, The most important thing I said even back then to them uh, was you can't have an ethics program without freedom of speech. And I told them, if if you don't have that, go work on that. Um, in theory, at least, we have more of that than a lot of other countries. I think we're doing the right regard. But I think the last five years have taught us how incredibly weak our anti-corruption mechanisms are and how vulnerable the checks and balances are to abuse. And I think the U.S. has lost the moral standing to be able to preach anti-corruption to other countries. Uh, The president, the current president, announced a big international anti-corruption drive this summer, and at least initially, until I and others complained, forgot to include the Office of Government Ethics in uh, the work. More recently, they've announced that they're not interested in having outside watchdog groups uh, give them advice or in any way participate. Uh, and they've made no effort to push for reforms. So our systems are continue to be absolutely as weak as they were during the last four years and are just awaiting uh, for another abuse uh, down the line of equal magnitude. And the problem is the systems we have were not holding up well and, and few that remained were beginning to crumble at the end of the four-year period. Uh, and I think the next time around, it will be in the exact same state that it was, uh, but the people coming in looking to abuse it will do a better job because they book to run from. And I also think um, some of the things are in the eye of the beholder. Certainly things are way better now than they were the last four years from option perspective. We don't have daily ethics scandals overwhelming us, and we have an attitude that favors at least compliance, where I think the last group weren't even interested in compliance with the existing rules. But this group seems to have taken a legalistic approach that is focused only on compliance with the rules that we now know are far too weak. Uh, We have defense contractors running the Department of Defense. We have shadow lobbyists in the White House and the State Department uh, and and we have a milk lobbyist leading the Department of Agriculture. So I think the United States has a long way to go to strengthen its ethics program and, frankly, to strengthen its democracy. And I think we are probably in the greatest danger we've ever been in. The, yeah, and the Trump administration, like you hit on, is widely known for its many ethical failings. I call them and that administration the Babe Ruth of corruption in modern administrations. So they did it really, really well. Um, but you've also been a big critic, just like we just heard right now, uh, of some of the Bi- new Biden administration's ethical lapses or precarious positions. But you started your position as director of government ethics under President Obama. Uh, How good or bad was the ethical standard before President Trump? Uh, What were some of the ethical problems that you identified and responded to during the Obama administration that we may not know about because the media just didn't really care? So I think um, the problems that uh, we saw during the Trump administration were not necessarily problems Trump created, but problems that Trump exploited. Uh, and when I was leading the Office of Government Ethics, I was in a very different role where, as, as a government official, I was limited to enforcing the existing laws. And so there were times when I saw things that exasperated me, uh, but my mission was to try to do the best I could within the existing laws. Now I have something of a freer hand to complain that those laws are too weak. Um, One of the things that infuriated me, um, even during the Obama administration, was, again, the sheer number of, of people who came from positions where they were sympathetic um, overly sympathetic to entities they regulated, just just as we're seeing now and as we saw even worse during the Trump administration. And I think it's important that people remember uh, personnel as policy. 
They're also, and this isn't unique to any administration, this goes back as far as I've ever been able to research. Um, you know, we've got a revolving door problem that uh, is not well addressed. And I think we need to do something uh, to make it harder to leave government and peddle influence. I think that there's also a problem coming in that people aren't having to recuse long enough or thoroughly enough uh, from business associates and former employers. And there's one story I can share because it's already public, um, and that was uh, that when Secretary of the Treasury Jack Lew first came in as a Deputy Secretary of State, um, he had an agreement that became publicly known uh, four years later when he became the head of the Office of Management and Budget, which was an employment agreement that said he could keep his huge bonus um, only if he landed a high-level position in the next administration. And that's just shocking, um, that kind of golden parachute payment. Uh, it, it's legal um, as long as you get it before the day that you start, but it sure looks like somebody's handing you money to buy your loyalty as, as you're about to become a government official with influence over their lives. And maybe not to that degree, but we see similar things all the time in the Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden administration, people who have unvested stock options that are supposed to expire as they leave their current employer. But the employers are waiving that requirement when they go into the government. And so they're effectively giving them a gigantic payment to go into government. They vest those stock options, and then the people can take them with them. Um, so I, I think um, there's always been these kind of problems. Now, I think, again, the difference between the Trump and Biden and Obama and even Bush administrations is that the other three administrations I dealt with were all focused on compliance. They were all interested in whether they were Republican or Democrat in following the existing rules, which again are too weak, but at least they had that. And uh, the Trump administration did not have any interest in abiding by existing rules. Um, I think in the Obama administration, particularly during the first four years, there was a real tone set from the top that ethics really matters. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have that in this administration. What we have in this administration is that compliance matters, which is different than ethics. Compliance is avoiding rules that make you, you know, avoiding breaking rules that would make you a criminal or a rule breaker. Uh, and that is not erring uh, to reach above the, the minimum that's allowed. So again, it's a huge improvement over what we had, but we're not even back to what we had during the Obama administration which, in my view, should have been stronger to begin with. So uh, I feel like Trump lowered the bar, and everybody's just content now with better than Trump, which I really don't feel should be the standard. Um, thank you for that and for everybody. So I was – my first job out of school was a lobbyist for a Fortune 400 agribusiness company. And then I went into Congress to work for the congressman representing the second largest agriculture district in the United States. And while I didn't have a golden parachute like Secretary Liu, um, contingent upon government employment, you could definitely feel that your knowledge was shaped on your experience in the private sector. So the revolving door is something that is very, very, very important and that we should all focus on. Um, but I wanted to get into s the fact that some ethical guidelines are written into law, but we also rely on a system of norms that are enforced voluntarily by public officials. In the Trump years, which we just discussed a little bit, we saw the weakness the weaknesses of many of these norms, which could easily be discarded by officials who don't wish to follow them. Now, while you are an expert, you're obviously a patriot, you're going through and giving us some great information. I want to pick your brain on what you think the norms that should be that most need to be codified into law are and where you would start in doing this. So I think the first thing I want to do is give a little bit different perspective on that. Um, we saw Trump blow through a lot of norms. 
Uh, and even in this administration, with with a Biden family member money off of his relationship to his father, um, we see some norms that were broken in the last administration not being restored. Um, and and people got very frustrated with norms because in some ways it all seemed like just a gentleman's agreement to behave. Uh, I think it actually was more than that. I think it was a fear that there would be actual consequences um, in terms of the electorate if you misbehaved enough. Um, and I think the last administration did have that fear for some reason, it, having to do with the way our society has become placed. And I think that changed things. And we'll never know how much the corruption actually drove him out of office. In all likelihood, the deciding factor was the botched pandemic response. Um, but I think the corruption gave a challenger a chance that a challenger wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, and so I don't think they'll draw that lesson from it, but I wish they would, that if they come back um, in 2025, they behave better. I, I'm not optimistic that they will. I'm, I'm convinced they, you know, they and others may not. But um, uh, so norms we learned are very weak. But we also learned that laws are weak. Um, um, Kellyanne Conway just violated the Hatch Act with absolute impunity. Uh, and she violated the misuse of position rules on one occasion. Um, and so rules are only as good as you have someone to enforce them. You know, I frankly think the president engaged in a quid pro quo trying to get a, a foreign power to interfere in our election. And that and other issues were not even going to be looked into by the Department of Justice, and there's no sign they're being looked into now. So I think you have to have both rules and norms, because without norms, you have laws that won't be enforced. And without laws, you have norms that can't be enforced. So I think you have to build both. And that's why, if I've been hard on this administration at times, it's because I feel that this compliance attitude rather than ethics um, has failed to restore norms that were shattered by the last administration, the adoption of an attitude that we're going to behave better than the last guy, as opposed to we've now seen the weaknesses in our system and we're going to not only rebuild it to what it was, but do better, um, has really um, destroyed an opportunity to establish stronger norms or even take us back to the norms we had before. And that's really uh, heartbreaking to me. Uh, in terms of laws, though, I do think that some laws can do wonders. I think that there there should be a divestiture requirement for the president. And, you know, there are people who argue, oh, it's unconstitutional because that establishes a qualification for being president and only the Constitution can do that. But it wouldn't be that because it wouldn't prevent you from being president. Uh, the penalty would be forfeiture of the assets. You sell them off and in, reinvest in things that are not conflicts or we just take them from you. And, you know, you have a long enough statute of limitations that the next president will be able to do just that. Uh, we could have disclosure of tax returns so that we could look for tax fraud. Uh, we could have rules on self-dealing that prevented the president and the president's appointees from doing business with the government. Uh, we could require candidate ethics plans so that when they file their first financial disclosure reports, candidates tell you exactly how they're going to manage their conflicts when they go into government. And while people can scoff because what that would mean uh, is it would be fairly non-binding but what it would do is if you had to disclose it at the beginning of your campaign, while there are other candidates of your own party standing on a stage, they could pummel you for a weak plan. Uh, and you'd come back to the next set of debates promising a stronger plan. Um, and that could create some pressure because people aren't going to be willing to change parties. They are going to be willing uh, to change primary candidates. 
we need to restore congressional power. And I think, again, one of my criticisms, not only of this administration, but those that came before Trump, is that all presidents in modern times have sought to expand potential power at the expense of legislative power. And unfortunately, the balance has, has shifted so much that Congress is utterly powerless. Uh, and I think we need, for instance, a mechanism to be able to enforce congressional subpoenas and an expedited judicial process. I mean, the Don McGahn uh, subpoena wound through the courts for two years, and the current president forced this Congress to settle for a closed-door deposition, and nobody read that deposition transcript. Uh, I think we need to uh, strengthen DOJ independence by requiring some reporting and a log um, on communications between the White House and DOJ. We need stronger whistleblower protections because whistleblowers are the patriots who defend us against corruption because they have inside knowledge. We could tighten the revolving door. And I also think there should be mandatory divestitures, not for just the president, but for all presidents' top appointees. And then I'll just throw out one more. I mean, I've got a list that I could go on for hours with, but one more uh, just to shake things up a bit is I think that people don't often think of civil service protections as ethics rules, and yet they're some of the most effective, important ethics rules there are, uh, because we have a law that says a career civil servant can refuse an unlawful order. Now, unfortunately, the people at the Office of Management and Budget failed to do that when President Trump told them to extort Ukraine. Um, but I do think that there were other cases where they were less reluctant to do things that were questionable, particularly at the Department of Justice, uh, both not only at the career level, but as we're now learning at some of the political um, level as well. And so I think... Um, and, and Trump was aware of that, which is why he had these attacks on what he called the deep state. But this, that administration was very inept, fortunately, and they really didn't know what they were doing. And they didn't figure out how to destroy the civil service until late October. And by then, the people who would have had to implement an order that he issued uh, didn't have time to accomplish it. Uh, but the next president who wants to destroy the civil service and replace a merit-based uh, civil service that's loyal to the country and to the Constitution with political hacks like we had in the 19th century under the spoil system, will have a roadmap to do it unless Congress um, amends the laws that Trump exploited. And so far, they've made no effort to do that. So uh, we should all be very alarmed about the lack of legislative to protect us from, from some of what we saw before. Can we get to a framework for anti-corruption action that's actually workable yeah. Considering especially that members of Congress have to write this stuff. So I, I haven't lost hope on that front. Um, the window is certainly closing, um, but it's not over yet. Um, for one thing, it should be it should be a bipartisan focus. I, I know that some in Congress are resistant because they think it's of Trump or they think that Trump won't be able to abide by those rules if he comes back in 2025. Um, but they should like it because they don't like the current guy. Uh, and so this would give them more tools to conduct oversight as well. Uh, it's good for the country to have the two branches in tension and have uh, checks and balances that we learned about in, in grade school actually be real. Um, and so, you know, there should be a bipartisan focus on on government ethics. And I think um, so far nobody has been able to persuade the people who are opposed to it that um, that it's coming from a nonpartisan place, that this is as good for them as it is for the other side because everybody will be playing on the same playing field and everybody will have tools to hold presidents accountable in the future, including presidents they don't like. Um, and, and in fact, the House has passed some, some ethics legislation. They passed H.R. Uh, the For the People Act, which would have been a good down payment on that front. 
Uh, and then Joe Manchin, a Democrat, gutted the ethics provisions completely uh, and came up with a compromise bill called the Freedom to Vote Act, which weirdly was slightly better than H.R. 1 on voting rights, which goes to show that it wasn't voting rights he opposed so much as ethics, which really concerning, particularly because he wouldn't even be covered by those ethics rules. They focused on the executive branch. Um, but the administration has was never excited about the ethics provisions of H.R. 1, and there may have been more going on behind the scenes, um, for all we know. I think that ethics legislation would have had a better chance if it had been championed by the president, just as I think voting rights would have had been championed by the president instead of focusing on roads and bridges. Uh, it's not that I don't think the other things are important, but without voting rights, none of those things will last. Um, and without ethics, democracy may not last. Uh, and so I think that and I don't know where it comes from. It, it could be a cluelessness. It could be, you know, this thought that the world is the same as it was in 1991 or 1971, but it's just not. We are in uncharted territory here, and democracy needs some fortification. Um, so we need leadership. We need leaders. The House has been doing its part. There's another great bill called Protecting Our Democracy Act that was supposed to come up for a vote this week in the House. I think it's been postponed, but watch for that because that is an incredibly important act that will do some of the things I said, including strengthen congressional subpoenas and limit some of the powers of the president. Um, and so there are people working on it. And I happen to know there are people in the Senate who are very focused on government ethics uh, there are some in both the House and Senate who are focused on addressing um, congressional stock trades. It just so far isn't a majority. Now, we had a very different situation after Richard Nixon. In the wake of the Watergate scandal, we had a wave of reforms that were at that time championed uh, by Jimmy Carter. So the president was very active in pursuing them. And Washington, being the town it is and always has been, uh, when I was at the Office of Government Ethics, they had a box full of news clippings, which before I left, we scanned, so th they're still safely there, but a box full of news clippings from the late 1970s uh, with people in D.C. going hysterical over the fact that the creation of the Office of Government Ethics and the passage of the Ethics and Government Act would mean an end to democracy because good people wouldn't be willing to go to Washington if there were lots of ethics rules and a morality police running around monitoring them, which, you know, by definition, they weren't really good people if they were afraid to, to go into government because there are ethics rules. So that was fairly laughable. And Congress wound up passing a, a bill that uh, was more about setting, uh, uh, doing a reset on the of ethics and, and made some real improvements, but definitely did not go far enough. And it worked fairly well with both parties for 40 years. Um, our bigger problems for those 40 years had to do with campaign finance more than any kind of um, financial conflicts of interest or, or the kind of run-of-the-mill corruption. Um but like anything, it needs a reset. You know, it's it's like a wheel that's you know attached to something that you give a spin and it runs out of momentum and it needs another spin. Well, the window of opportunity for that was in the wake of the Trump administration, particularly uh, because the current president ran on an anti-corruption platform and uh, his written platform talked about legislative reform. It was. Uh, one legislative proposal after another, and we've seen no sign of it in the Senate. Similarly, with the Department of Justice, I suppose it's remotely possible there may be some investigations going on, but it doesn't seem likely because none of it has become public, and as many um, 
uh, former prosecutors on Twitter have pointed out correctly, uh, by this point, there would have been communications with defendants and their attorneys and requests for records and documents. And there would be enough noise of this that people would be aware of it. But there seems to be no um, movement towards accountability. And Garland seems to be living up to his name where garlands are mostly decorative. And I guess um, Attorney General Garland is decorative. The last question for you, and this just boggles my mom, Walt. When Governor Bob McDonald of Virginia was convicted of public corruption, the Supreme Court unanimously overturned the conviction. This just wasn't Thomas and Alito. It was the left's heroes of Ginsburg and Sotomayor. Has the Supreme Court made it impossible to prosecute some crimes like bribery? And will the court stand in the way of new ethics reforms? In my view, and I'm certainly not speaking for my organization when I say this, the Supreme Court is a ridiculous body um, that is openly hostile to anti-corruption efforts to a person. As you say, it was a unanimous decision. The the only thing all of these members agree on is that they hate anti-corruption laws. Uh, And so they're fine with a guy like McDonald running around um, taking effectively bribes, uh, and, and they let him off on a technicality. They, they One of the aspects of the decision was focused on the term official act, because you're not allowed to take a bribe in exchange for an official act. And they said that meetings are not official acts, which just goes to show that one of the problems with Supreme Court justices is, is that they live in an ivory tower and have absolutely no meaningful connection to the real world anymore, because there's a multi-billion dollar lobbying industry focused on promising uh, well-moneyed interests that they can get them access to government officials. I joked with my staff, because I was so angry at the time of that decision, that we should just post a roster of fees on our webpage Uh, and our own personal account numbers so that anybody who wanted a meeting could just look up how much they'd have to pay us to have a meeting with us, since a meeting is not an official act. Um, And that is one of the biggest obstacles to reigning in corruption in this country is our broken Supreme Court. Um, That's going to be difficult to fix, but what it's going to take is a Congress that's committed to fixing that so that they can keep every time the Supreme Court knocks down an anti-corruption law, coming back with a new version of the anti-corruption law that sidesteps whatever excuse uh, the court used to avoid holding government officials accountable for for essentially an attack on democracy uh, founded in greed. We're going to start with uh, Stephanie first, and then we will go to Marilyn. Um, Stephanie, over to you. Justin, thank you for having me. And Walt, it's been a real pleasure to listen to this conversation with you. Look, I think, um, you know, as a former Republican political consultant that has gotten Republicans elected at all levels of office and uh, joined the forces of the Lincoln Project during the 2020 election, it was not a it was not a partisan decision on my part. It was a it was a decision about protecting this democracy. And for those of us that are students of history and politics, it felt very clear. It still remains clear that our democracy is hanging um, in the balance. And if we do, if we did not receive enough warning of that, um, then I think people aren't paying close enough attention, not to mention this pandemic that continues to rage on. And I wonder, Walt, from your perspective, I've listened to some of your commentary, but you're right. It is the it is the role of Congress, indeed, to sort of police their own. And I think that both sides, um, at least on one side, does say it in the quiet, I hope at night, understanding what's happening with our democracy. And have we, is the complexity of the United States relative to how many people we have, how many languages we have, um, and of those languages, how many people have differences of what they believe right to be and wrong to be, et cetera. Have we outgrown our current form? And how do we indeed encourage and create a system of good governance where we do have people actually elected to represent the interests of those people as well as the interests of the entire country? Have we outgrown it? Have we gotten too complex? Walt, I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Great points. Um, I personally think that there is a path forward where 
this country has a future still before it. And they get there if more people get engaged in the work of democracy. And I think one thing we saw during the last four years was more and more people turning around and looking at what was going on and finding ways to get involved. And I think we need people running for office, you know, hopefully from both parties, because I would like to have two functioning viable parties in this country again. Um, and um, running for things as low level as school board or um, county administrator or town council, uh, all the way up to the higher level positions. I think also people need to be willing to protest. I think people need to be willing to put pressure on their members of Congress with phone calls and emails and all of these things and, and writings. And while they may at times feel just you know, hopeless because these members of Congress are well insulated by both gerrymandering and campaign finance laws, um, it's not necessarily them you're trying to persuade. This is a longer fight. And what you need to be doing is trying to persuade other citizens to get involved in democracy and find a path forward, even for differing viewpoints uh, from the from the right to the left. Um, because, you know, it, we need two viable functioning parties. Um, and... Um, you know, I think also some of the complexity based into baked into our governmental system uh, that makes us different than a lot of European countries is both a curse and a, and a blessing. Uh, on the one hand, um, it's a curse because it can be frustrating and inconsistent and uh, slow and, and have many people with a say in things wrestling. On the plus side, it means that uh, the central government, when it runs amok like it did for four years, doesn't have total control. You know, this isn't France. The provinces are departments of the federal government, of the central government. Here we have multiple uh, governments. And so it's both the strength and a weakness. And I think we just have to learn how to f function within the existing framework. But I think that will become impossible uh, in a large respect if voter suppression succeeds. And that's where I'm appalled that our leaders haven't prioritized voting rights law as opposed to economic packages. And um, I think the public has a role in putting pressure on our leaders to get serious about voting rights. And I think even if we fail there, I, you know, I'm outraged by what was attributed to the White House, the statement that, oh, you guys are just going to have to out-organize uh, voter suppression. You, you can't out-organize a law that lets um, legislators, partisan legislators, decide the outcome of an election in a state. But again, I think it's important to remember there's hope to be found in the fact that a majority of Americans aren't even voting. And while voter suppression accounts for some of that, uh, I think despair over corruption and over a feeling that um, government isn't responsive to them has driven a lot of people not to engage. And this is where, again, it's not necessarily the elected officials you're trying to persuade. It's your fellow citizens that if all Americans voted. The one thing we know for sure is that both parties would transform significantly uh, because parties cater to voters and who is voting would change if everyone votes. So I think I don't think all is lost. I have my dark days where just, you know, we all have a hard time feeling like there's hope. Uh, but overall, I still feel like there's plenty of fight left in the American people and plenty of hope left for democracy. Thank you, Walt. Justin, thanks for having me. Th thank you very much, Stephanie. Walt, sounds like we'll have to have you back in short order to talk about um, voting rights. And actually, there was a ballot measure to expand voting access in New York, and a bunch of liberals voted that one down. So we will go to Marilyn and then Greg Sattel next. Marilyn, nice to see you on stage. Do you have a question for our esteemed guest, Walter Schaub? 
Hi, uh, I just wanted to first say hello to Walter. I don't know if you remember me. <laughs> I sure but... do. It's been a while, but it's nice <laughs> seeing your uh, it's avatar. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I was the editor of the Conflicts of Interest team, reporting team at uh, NPR, and often uh, spoke with Mr. Schaub about uh, conflicts of interest involving the Trump administration. And uh, my question for you is about our old favorite topic, uh, the Emoluments Clause. You know, when we talked a lot about this back in 2017, um, there were groups that had uh, were suing the Trump administration or President Trump over the idea that he was clearly violating the Emoluments Clause. That's the part of the Constitution where the founding fathers wanted to make it very clear that they did not think that a president should be profiteering. You should not be making money from being president. Your job should be the pres being president. But because of uh, obvious conflicts of interest, like owning the Trump Hotel just blocks from the White House, foreign diplomats, all sorts of people stayed there, lobbyists spent money. They were enriching the president, which seemed to be a pretty clear violation of the Emoluments Clause. So all these people sued. Uh, Democrats in Congress sued to try to stop this, to try to enforce the clause. Um, Crew, that's the uh, group with, that uh, stood up for ethics, they sued. Uh, state attorneys general. Everybody was trying to get the emoluments clause to have some meaning, and nobody could ever get standing. It seemed like all of the suits just went away because courts would say, well, you don't really have standing. So if co members of Congress don't have standing, if states attorneys generals don't have standing, if private ethics groups don't have standing, is the emoluments clause just been written out of the Constitution? Can it ever be enforced? Is it Has it become meaningless? You know, in its current form, uh, it, it effectively has. Part of this, as um, Dahlia Lithwick uh, wrote in an article at the time, the courts seemed to be slow walking that and a number of other cases. And so the courts actually uh, sort of across the board, except in certain instances, showed a real reluctance to get involved in some of these issues. And, and again, that speaks to the weakness of our judiciary. But as you say, standing was the issue, and standing is the legal principle that you, you have to have an injury, in fact, that you can actually um, sue to have redressed. And um, one thing about standing is that Congress can create standing. It could pass laws giving people standing to enforce things, and I think we've learned mm -hmm. that we can't count on the government to do it. So I actually think a great creative approach to a lot of our problems would be to give individuals more ability to sue, more standing for some of these issues. In Blumenthal last week, Senator Blumenthal introduced a bill that would address um, emoluments by supplying some definition to them uh, in particular and, and fleshing out some of the procedural details um, the project on government oversight and um, protecting democracy uh, and a couple other groups got together and wrote an even more comprehensive version. Um, and so, again, here's where if there was leadership either out of the White House or in the Senate um, really pushing for some of these reforms to give teeth to our existing um, supposed protections that aren't working – uh, we could strengthen these things. And it's important to remember that the very first ethics provisions in this country w were the two emoluments clauses. And the foreign emoluments clause in particular um, was based on the great fear of the founders that uh, foreign entanglements and, and foreign influence could truly undermine our our. Our democracy, and we've been seeing that. You know, we've had hostile foreign powers that have gotten very good at that, um, and so really, we are sort of teetering on a knife's edge, and we need Congress to stand up and, and do its job. So, I think the answer to your question is, in its current form, I think future lawsuits will take four years, and I think the courts will again horse around, will slow walking things. And will again challenge standing. 
um, unless Congress passes some legislation. And, and there is at least um, uh, Blumenthal's bill and the Protecting Our Democracy Act, which I mentioned, also addresses mm. emoluments. And so um, there are legislative efforts. There just isn't uh, the political will to push them over the, the threshold yet. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Marilyn, um, and comprehensive answer, Walter, on the emoluments clause, something that's very, very important and obviously took uh, more public attention during the Trump administration than maybe ever before. We will go to Gell, and then we will go to Max. Greg, over to you, good sir. Thanks, Justin, and and thanks for joining us, uh, Walter. You were uh, discussing before the interplay between rules and norms. Uh, isn't it also true that that during the Trump administration, old rules um, became strengthened by, by by new norms, specifically the the uh, the FARA Act, the the Foreign Agents Re Registration Act, which had never really been enforced b before Manafort. Um, what potential do you think there there is for? other old rules besides FARA to gain new strength from, from new norms? You know, that's a really great example. FARA is one of the few things that we saw um, gain life during the last administration in response to it. Um, that, again, sort of goes back to um, the civil service uh, rules protecting some of the career people uh, who, who were pursuing that, although, of course, there had to have been skill appointees uh, supportive of that effort. I think, um, again, it's crucial, though, to, to strengthen some of these civil service protection. We can see more of that. I think also there are choices that are made that don't have to be set in stone. You know, yesterday or the day before, I guess, um, the Office of Special Counsel, which is not Mueller, but is a standalone agency that enforces the Hatch Act, which is the law that um, prohibits misusing official position for uh, um, to, to influence an election. Uh, that office issued a new finding that 13 officials had violated the um, Hatch Act, and it did a couple good things in the report. It, it it, it, the agency normally drops investigations when people leave government, but that agency decided to go forward with these 13 investigations. And it laid out in great detail some of the weaknesses with its authority and made some proposals for legislative reform, most of which I agree with, a couple I disagree with. Um, but unfortunately, that report did something else, and it doubled down on the position of the current special counsel that it was just fine to hold um, the the nominating convention, the RNC, at the White House, which was possibly one of the most shocking, appalling sights of the last administration. It, it looked like something out of Belarus or some other authoritarian country and should never have happened. And frankly, I think the legal framework is strong enough that the special counsel could have done more to shut it down or create um, at least a real dilemma for the people who wanted to go forward. And I think he got scared and didn't pursue it. Um, I think I would like to see the next special counsel, because this one's term is going to run out, um, take a stronger stand on that issue and not be bound by the incorrect decision on that. And if that happens, I think we could see a special counsel's office do more to try to disrupt um, an administration trying to hold um that that uh, kind of event there. Um, in terms of us that I think we could see more of, you know, possibly a lot of the criminal provisions that the Department of Justice didn't pursue, you're not going to see a Department of Justice pursue any president, at least certainly not while they're in office. But um, we did see them enforcing campaign finance laws against Michael Cohen, and they they identified as his co-conspirator, Individual One, who, who to this day 
uh, is roaming the streets free. Um, it was bold of them to go after Michael Cohen. And I think um, there may be other laws that the Department of Justice could pursue if it successfully um, insulates itself. I, I guess the truth is I'm hard pressed to think of too many others that I could see um, um, going the route of the FARA Act, but but it's a really good question, and, and it gives me the idea to maybe start thinking about that over the next couple of years before uh, we ever face a, a dilemma like we had the last one. So that's that's a really great question, Greg, and I think um, I think it's something worth really thinking about. Uh, thank you very much, Greg, with that um, great question there about Farah and Paul Manafort and um, how we should view it moving forward. We will go to just two more questions, then we will end it. We will go to um, Max, and then we will go to Sequoia. So, Max, over to you. Hi, Well, I wanted to ask about the issue of uh, shadow lobbying, which I, I think – has to do with uh, the distinction between lobby groups and uh, con consultancies. Um, consultancies don't reveal their clients like lobbying groups have to. And uh, if those clients are corporations, which they often are, uh, corporations don't really discuss who offers consulting work for them. And when you have the Biden administration taking this kind of legalistic approach of disclosing, you know, the bare minimum that's required by the law, it's very hard for the public to get much sunlight on uh, what's really going on there. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about how this is playing out in the administration. I know that they have talked about instituting like a one-year ban on uh, shadow lobbying once you leave the administration, but I kind of wonder if maybe the bigger issue is coming from one of these groups uh, and going into the administration in the first place. Yeah, that's Thanks. a great question, uh, Max. I, I, I agree with everything you said. Um, the the idea of shadow lobbying is itself sort of a murky concept, and maybe we all use the term differently. Uh, I agree with how you define it. It also sometimes is individuals who work for a consultancy that go and advise corporations on how best to persuade the administration and who to contact and what to say um, and how to package it based on priorities that the, the advisor knows an administration has. And frankly, that also is peddling influence. That is taking insider knowledge and using it for financial gain uh, when you leave. And the rules aren't going to prevent that. Uh, you, you, so even on the way out, there are, the, the thing has so many workarounds. Um, but, it, but it is even more troubling when they come in. And the lack of transparency, by the way, is a choice the administration has made. Uh, for instance, when Anita Dunn from the consultancy SKDK came in, uh, they brought her in as a special government employee and set her pay below the level at which she would have to file a public financial disclosure report. So we're all in the dark as to what conflicts of interest she had. Uh, yesterday, uh, another employee from SKDK announced that he's going into government and uh, to work in the White House Counsel's office, and he's not even quitting his job with SKDK. He's going to take a leave of absence, which means he's not even quitting his day job when he comes in to influence government and then goes back out to that firm and peddles influence. Uh, we saw something like that in the last administration with Kurt Volker, whose name people may know because he was the Ukraine envoy uh, who featured prominently in the first impeachment hearing of Trump. And he didn't quit his job at BBG, which had as clients uh, Raytheon, which made the Javelin anti-tank missiles that Ukraine wanted to buy and that Volker was active in trying to persuade uh, the U.S. to sell uh, offensive weapons. Um, and uh, 
had the government of Ukraine as a client while Volcker was uh, in that job. And, and by the way, under the conflict of interest law, your employer's interests are imputed to you. So I'm sort of mystified as to how anybody thought that was OK. Uh, you know, I have some confidence that this administration, with its compliance attitude, will at least um, keep some of these SKDK people from working on matters uh, directly affecting the financial interests of SKDK or meeting with SKDK. But these are people who are going to come in uh, having, as Justin said, their their world outlook shaped uh, by SKDK and their knowledge that they're going back to SKDK, uh, or in the one case, never even left it. And that's got to have an influence on how they give advice and what policies they're going to push. And we have no transparency as a result of the choice the administration made to conceal their clients from us. Um, and um, I find that deeply troubling. You know, I was glad that Biden's executive order added the shadow lobbying piece. Uh, some members of Congress, like Elizabeth Warren, have been pushing for that kind of thing. Um, and um, uh, but as you say, they didn't do it on the way into government. They did it on the way out. Uh, similarly, we have defense contractors running DOD and running the Air Force and maybe other positions. Those are the two that jump to my mind at, at DOD. The heads of DOD and the Air Force are defense contractors. And uh, sure, they're going to sell their stocks. And just recently, the Air Force sold off his stocks in, in um, Lidos, I think, um, and, um, and and probably recuse from at least party matters involving those companies. But again, their viewpoint is shaped by it. Uh, at least um, Austin, who leads DOD, agreed that for four years he wouldn't uh, go back, but uh, no such commitment has been made by other uh, top policymakers at DOD. So it isn't even just the shadow lobbyists. We got to take a look at um, corporate officials going agencies their corporations uh, contract with or are regulated by. Um, we saw Bill Wareham in the last administration come from a law firm. Uh, that represented um, the electric generating industry, a major air polluter, and he came in to be the air pollution guy and then promptly continued meeting uh, with his old law firm and clients. So basically, between July when he sat in one meeting and December when he sat in another meeting, he switched sides of the table. Um, so I think we really all need to remember that personnel is policy, and that just because something's legal doesn't make it right. And I think when an administration um, chooses to bring certain people in and then chooses not to have transparency, they're embracing compliance and not ethics. Now, I will give this administration, having reinstated Obama's lobbyist um, employment ban, and so we're seeing fewer lobbyists in positions in government, uh, and, and that's nice. Uh, but again, um, it was one incremental change, and then on the other issues, we're seeing compliance rather than ethics. It's a great question, Max. Sequoia, over to you, good friend. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Uh, thank you, Walter, uh, for your work. This is, in my opinion, the most important thing that we need to be talking about for preserving our democracy right now. Um, and my question has to do if you had seen the Reuters investigation uh, article called Out of Control. Um, it's about pharmaceutical, how they've been shaping policy over the past few decades, and specifically around diabetes medication. Um, and it, the, the headline of the article, this is part two, uh, is drug makers pushed aggressive diabetes therapy and patients paid the price. And it de describes a series of tactics that the pharmaceutical companies did to even bypass the, um, the, the different advisory boards within healthcare. 
And they did it through a lot of PR work, and they also did it through a lot of advertising on for their drugs. And so they got the A1C target of seven to get below seven to be the mantra for the world. It's a very interesting article, and it talks about how that led to deaths in the United States. So in the context that you've been talking about uh, politicians and even some administration people, how do you think we should look at this kind of tactic that is used by large corporations, specifically around spending dollars on things like healthcare. You know, I know we in New Zealand are the only countries, I think, that allow pharmaceutical companies to advertise on TV, for example. Yeah. Uh, I have to admit, I did not read that article, but I just wrote down the title of it, and I can't wait to read it. Um, you know, just to give you one example, I was grumbling about SKDK in response to the last question, and uh, Pfizer is one of their clients. And Pfizer, of course, has an enormous interest in what um, the White House does. I think maybe this would be a good time to talk, get a little technical, um, and just share um, how the current system works um, in terms of ethics to really highlight some of the problems. Um, let's say somebody's coming into a, a regulatory position from a pharmaceutical company, say at the FDA, and uh, they have a bunch of stock options that they're not allowed to take with them because they're unvested. So the first thing that happens is the pharmaceutical company can vest all of those stock options so it doesn't have to forfeit them. Uh, and perhaps they wind up selling them and making a ton of money. Uh, that's just a gift they get on the way in. In fact, they can actually give them a straight up cash payment if they want. Um, and um, as long as it's given before they enter government, it's not illegal. We saw that with Jack Lou. Uh, then they come in and they have to recuse from everything affecting the industry for as long as they hold financial interest in the pharmaceutical company. But if they sell off their pharmaceutical stock, um, they may have to recuse from particular matters involving specific parties. And that's a legal term, but basically it means you no longer have to recuse from the whole industry. Your uh, slice of activities that you're now going to have to sit out of has gotten very narrow, literally, unless the other company is sitting across the table or has, an, uh, has a party interest in a matter like a contract or litigation or a grant um, or an application for, you know, a new drug application. Um, uh, you don't have to recuse. And at the higher levels, they're setting policy. They're not working on individual new drug applications. Uh, and so they can then write policies that give wide latitude to the industry they just came from uh, and help make it more profitable as long as it's focused on the industry and not the individual company. And ironically, you may only have one or two companies that can create a certain treatment but you can probably still par participate in regs affecting that because uh, they're not a party to the matter and, and it's um, a matter of general applicability. It just happens that others are not directly involved in it at this time. Uh, so there's a lot of ways that they can then skew public policy to the benefit of the companies they came from uh, and, um, not necessarily focus on the direct interests of the public. And then they can leave government and go back to work for that same company. And unless they had an express agreement, an arrangement to come back, they didn't have to recuse from the whole industry. So now they go back to that company with all the insider knowledge. And the only thing they can't do is communicate with their old agency but they can do sort of the shadow lobbying where they help somebody else prepare and know who to call and know what to say. Uh, and so, again, our ethics rules are incredibly weak and leave so much opportunity for people to come into government with um, uh, the interests of uh, the, the industry they just left at heart. Um, and... Um, that's just a shame because those are the entities that are supposed to be standing up for us. 
Now, of course, there are two sides to the issue, and people who are opposed to stricter ethics rules say that it affects recruitment and keeps you from bringing in people who supposedly know the industry best, therefore have the technical expertise you need and and can spur innovation. That's the the buzzword they like to use, innovation. Uh, The problem is, though, if they have that superior knowledge, they often can use it in ways that others can't understand how they're shaping things to benefit their companies. And so, yeah, you know, maybe you want some advisors, but you don't necessarily want the decision makers having such strong ties to the entities that they're supposed to be regulating or contracting with. Uh, And that uh, is something that is not addressed by our current rules. And it's so easy to rotate in and out of government because the recusals are so incredibly narrow. Um, And uh, it's part of why we really need an ethical renaissance to to protect democracy. So uh, I will definitely go read Out of Control by Reuters. Uh, I have not read that, so I don't know the specifics. Um, uh, When I was at Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, um, we identified a number of meetings with specific industries in which Mark Short, the vice president's chief of staff, met during the pandemic response. That office was supposedly in charge of the pandemic response, at least according to Trump. And Mark Short was the head of that office. And he held stocks in companies. And then they'd hold these meetings with a particular industry, like pharmaceuticals or uh, insurance companies. And we found photographs of him sitting at the table with these, including some whose stocks he held. Um, how that does not implicate the conflict of interest statute, I will never know. Uh, we wound up writing to, uh, I think it was the FBI, and there's no they've taken any interest in it. So even when you, you have rules, um, it's. I, I have always found the Department of Justice and the FBI supremely uninterested in the conflict of interest rule, except for lower level employees. They'll prosecute the, the regional um, office's administrator who hires her kid's um, moving company, but they won't prosecute a chief of staff with real power to affect the transition, uh, uh, the, the pandemic who's sitting across the table from companies whose stock he holds. They're uh, talking the best ways to respond to the pandemic, and human lives are at stake, and people are dying by the hundreds of thousands. Uh, So we have weak rules, and we have people not enforcing them. Again, I don't think this is cause for hopelessness. I think this is cause for the public to redouble its engagement in democracy Um, I'll put in a plug for our group. The Project on Government Oversight is aggressive about trying to expose these things and and help shape policy to change things. We're working with a lot of members of Congress. And um, um, I just think there are so many ways the public can get involved. And I think all of this is not cause for despair, but cause for outrage and cause for the public to get more deeply engaged in the work of democracy. So don't give up hope, but uh, be mad as hell. (laughs) Well, that's all we have for you today. Again, huge thanks to Walter for coming out, to our audience for their great questions, and to you for being here. As always, if you like or dislike what you hear, if you want to find out how to join us live almost every day of the week, maybe ask one of our upcoming guests a question, please visit our website, pm101.live or pm101.club. They both work and will get you to the same place where you can find all that and more. This has been Politics and Media 101. I'm Jeff Browning. On behalf of Justin Higgins, our co-founder and our team, thank you very much for being here. We hope to see you and hear from you soon.